Hey, welcome back, everybody. The Pre-Hospital Paradigm Podcast. I'm Scott Wildenheim. Uh, to my left here, we got Caleb Ferroni, <laughs> Doctor Doctor John Hill, and uh, I got Ray Pace over there on the uh, other side of the other side of the table. So, this is the uh, uh, fifth. <laughs> also, <laughs> also known in, in some ter- other terminology is the fifth of uh, yeah the f- fifth Monday. Um, but the uh, the fifth Monday, yes, that was it was what I was quoted as saying. But uh, the fifth Monday of October, so it's your uh, as promised. This is the leftovers from uh, from the uh, the previous fifth Monday. There you go. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll work it in there for you. The uh, but uh, yeah, we had some additional leftovers that we didn't get to in the in, in the last extras episode. And uh, that's still some some medication stuff, and then we've got some uh, audience audience questions here. If we have time, uh, we're trying to get this into into an hour, right? So uh, regaining or you know reestablishing our list here, and some of the stuff that uh, we didn't talk about last time was the heparin and the heparin concentration, and as you know, anybody read the protocol, sixty units per k up to four thousand units, and that is what causes us some angst. So. That kind of kind of kind of comes down to how it's supplied, right? And the uh, it's supplied as five thousand units. And here's the here's the here's the kicker, right? It's in uh, it's in one milliliter. So um, we have to we have to break that down. It's uh, and we've got to give eight tenths or point eight eight milliliters, and uh, to get that four thousand units. And now we were talking um, about about that 4,000 units and, and what happens if you inadvertently give the 5,000 units. So did you, did you want to talk to that a little bit? Or, I mean, I mean if it happens, it happens quite often, it's, it's, right? Yeah, right. Um, and, and, and it's okay. It, it, if it does happen, we need to know about it. It, so, is, a, it is a medication error. Right? It is a medication error. You're falling outside of protocol. You do need to report it. You need to make sure that the docs know at the agent, the hospital you arrive at, that that's what was given. Um, it's not the biggest uh, deal in the book. We can uh, – one of the great things about heparin is it's reversible. We can give a medication to reverse heparin if we give too much. And likely you're giving it for a STEMI patient who's going to get even more heparin on later on down the road. Correct. So we're going to trend the, the, the tests, uh, make sure that – uh, the patients are acting appropriately. They're probably going to get more heparin in, uh, interoperatively anyway. So it's it's going to be okay. Um, and the 5,000 units is a typical dose that we give all the time. It's just for the patients that are going for these procedures. Other indications. Yeah. 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 Uh, and don't take that as just a, a carte blanche. It's okay to – it's okay just to give the five. That's not the messaging no. here at all, right? Correct. Um, uh, this is, and Ray, maybe you want to talk a little bit about this, but, uh, you know, Harrington Heart and Vascular Institute are the ones that ask us to do this from the get-go. Um, you know, it was their research and, and whatnot that got us to that to that dosing regimen. So we're trying to adhere to what it is they yeah. ask us to do. Yeah, 100%. I mean, everything that we do pre-hospitally aligns with HHVI, um, and that's where heparin and Verlenta were born. And... The big thing is we always want to dose any medication, you know, the right way. We talked about the five rights, uh, try to avoid medication errors. Um, but specifically with heparin, you know, there's some there's some cheat sheets, if you will, in the back of the protocol. If you look in there on the medication page, it'll say if your patient weighs 147 pounds or greater, they need to receive 4,000 units 4, of heparin. Yeah. So um, it's, it's, it's just an easy easy thing that we're able to do. How much does the patient weigh? If they're greater than 147 pounds, you know I need to give this patient 4,000 units. I am a firm believer in utilizing a 1cc syringe, right? Instead of um, sometimes we'll have providers that will try to use a 3cc or a 5cc and they're like, I'll ballpark it to, you know, be just less than one. And that's just not ideal. That's not what we want to do. So use a 1cc syringe, Draw to point eight. You're able to to give that medication and administer it appropriately. Um, and and like Doctor Hill said, these are mainly STEMI patients who are given this too. And it's really important, especially for um, the squads. And I kind of clump Brelent and Heparin together on purpose. But you know, in, in some of the squads that are farther away from the hospital, they're giving these drugs, and we want Brelent on board early. And that's what HHVI wants because that can help to prevent. 
um, reocclusion of the stent after so it's been placed. It. So that's that's probably one of the biggest things that we want to do. And some squads also have a um, a longer transport time. So by giving heparin, by giving Berlin to the STEMI patient, your initial 12 lead before all the medications have been given is very important. That's going to show your STEMI. Now, if that squad has that 45-minute drive time to the hospital and I've given aspirin, 4,000 units of heparin, 180 milligrams of Berlenta, and now we're there and it's like, well, I can't, I can barely see this STEMI anymore. That's We've had that happen in transports to UH Giaga, UH Portage, which is great because ideally we are still oxygenating a portion of that heart. There's still a clot there and it needs corrected and the patient needs PCI. Um, but, you know, there's just a... The synergy of all those medications working together is very important, but it's it's very easy to dose. And you know, if you're looking at this syringe here, it's a 10 cc syringe, and the markings that you're going to get are going to be half an ml half or an one ml, ml, and that's it. You know, you're not you're not breaking it down to the mm -hmm. to the fine points the of that. Of yeah, milliliter, right? you need the tenth of a milliliter, and I'm very pro using the one cc syringe to give the accurate dosing. And they're in the bottom of the drug box. If you use our drug box, you know, we have the bag of goodies. Just don't steal it because pharmacy gets really angry when you take the whole bag of goodies out. They like you to, you know, put it back in there. So use whatever you want out of it, but, but keep it in the bottom of the drug box. And we're talking specifically about heparin here and, yes. and, and cutting that down into, into much smaller doses. But you should be doing, you know, the provider on their own accord should take some time and, and mentally work through, hey, if I need to give smaller doses of huh. any medication, what is an appropriate size syringe, right? You went, you know, these only have half milliliter, but, you know, I think it's third or something on, on three milliliters. I'm like, but yeah. the, the, the point is, um, is you need to spend some, some self-reflection time with what you have available to you as far as volumes. This is, of course, especially important when we're talking about pediatrics, right? If we're drawing up those, you know, small volumes uh, in, in many cases, uh, you know, you, you often can't, times can't do that with a larger syringe because you don't have the, the proper gradation in there to, to administer it safely and effectively, right? A really good sit around the table after hours firehouse drill or EMS drill would be yeah. to take a few assortments of syringes, sit there with your protocol book and a cup of water and draw up what's required and, and just get the, the mental visual you know, just doing it down. Sure. And if you can draw them up, you know, have everybody verify it and then uh, the next guy do it. I think that's a great point because a lot of times, a lot of times when we talk about medication errors, and I, I don't really want to go away from heparin, but this will talk about heparin, is, you know, I take my 60 units per kilo and then I multiply it and then I get, well, this is how many units I need to give. Okay, so it, let's say they're less than 147 pounds. How do I get there? Right. right? So I've already broken heparin down to um, 5,000 units in one ml. So if you want to get to 0.8 and they weighed 147 pounds, I'm dividing 4,000 by 5,000. That gives me 0.8. That's my volume I want to give of that medication. Right. My dose is the units. And I think Kayla brings up a huge point where we make medication errors in pediatric patients. It's very easy to say, okay, this child weighs this in pounds. I convert it to kilograms, and then I'm, I need to give, I'll use Benadryl just to be easy, one milligram per kilogram of Benadryl. So now I multiply that. Okay, well, there's 50 milligrams of Benadryl now in here. How do I get that volume that I want to deliver to the patient? I think that's our biggest challenge in pediatrics. So it's really good to do stuff like that. You know, syringes are cheap. I mean, what do they cost? 10, 15, maybe 20 cents. Get some water, a cup, and then throw out a couple just common medications that you have to do that and actually drop yeah, the volume. It's make a good it a drill. Yeah, it's pull a it up. good practical. And, and UH, I mean, the, you guys did awesome with Certidose. I mean, to cut down on some of our anxiety about pediatric doses, but that's only covering those three meds. Yes. So the rest of them, we need, need to be proficient. Yeah, and, and you can refer to the pediatric tables, too. I'm, yeah. I'm very pro dose. I think, you know, a PED arrest or uh, a, a very bad PED trauma would be one of the most, you know, stressful calls, and if you will. How often do we get it? <laughs> and that, and that's, the, that's, the, that's the other issue, too. It's, it's, it's low frequency, high risk is one of the challenges, but you can use the pediatric tables as well. I would, that's if, at any I time, <clears throat> yeah, use the pediatric drug tables. The The dosing is already figured out for you. It tells you if this is the dose supplied. In milligrams, yeah. In, you know, in milligrams, and then it gives you the volume, let's say, Verset. You know, say it's five milligrams of Verset and two mLs or however it's supplied, 10 and two. Um, and, you know, my child weighs this, you want to give this dose, and that is this many milliliters. Okay. And usually you're back to that, 
that one cc syringe again because until you get into the the higher weighted charts a lot of your volumes really not going to be over an ml a lot of times for some of the some of the medications Absolutely correct Absolutely. um you know each one varies but uh you just use the charts it's just it's so much easier 3 a.m that's why they're there. Our, our partner says UH uh, Pharmacy have helped us update that over the years. Always make sure it's accurate, and, and it's a good tool to avoid any type of mistakes. Quick, quick shout out for uh, to uh, Assistant Chief Bernhard from Highland Heights. Yes, Highland Heights, who took the time to do all that math for you, yeah, right? So yeah, definitely, um, you know, the part of our protocol committee, and then thanks, uh, you know, thanks Bill for taking the time to to do that and making that that reference material what it is. Um, Remember too, I, I on the last to, episode we talked the last. Fist episode. We talked fifth. about Full um, not being able to cheat once you've graduated. If I have a pediatric call, and, and just remember, I mean, call ahead, dispatch, hey, get a weight so I can write that weight down if and you convert can. everything. And if this is a seizure call, I've already have that converted. If you know, get it, get it pre done. <laughs> yeah, I agree. That's and great. if you can't, if you can't get a weight, you can generally <clears throat> get, hey, Google, give me an average weight for a five year old. <clears throat> mm-hmm. And then when you get there, you've Done half the battle. You're done half, so. Yeah, you're you're close, right? Yeah, I the, agree. The, the other point that needs to be made with with the protocol, you're speaking about the the Adobe protocol product is available on our website. So <clears throat> now I need to contrast that with, of course, the other product that's in our Response world as well, which is ResponseSoft, right? So you know, from an ease and a- ease of access of the protocol pages themselves, that's great. Everybody really. S- I, I think, in my opinion, overemphasizes the fact that there's a drug weight calculator on there. Um, and that's in pounds, not it's, kilograms. It's, it's convenient. And, and yeah, that doesn't really matter to, to me all that much. It still tells me how many milligrams, right? But mm-hmm. where the error is going to get made, to your previous point, Ray, is is converting that into how many milliliters do I draw? Yeah. So I think it solves half the problem, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, they would have to figure out some back end way to put in standard concentrations to do the math. I mean, it's, it's yeah, that it's is what a computer does, it's, yeah, right? It's the, volume um, the issue. it's the volume that you're going to mess up on, and I, I you know, it, it frustrates me when people are like, "Well, I've got this." I'm like, "You've got half an answer, mm-hmm. right?" Yep. Um, look, at two o'clock in the morning, I'm tired. I'm hungry. You know, I got to pee. I haven't eaten. My, you know, my, my parents my, are my, screaming my, at you. People are screaming at me. Um, what again? In my personal case, I just took those protocol pages, I laminated them, I put them on a on a ring, and they, it goes in my pocket. It's also in my in my peds bag as well. Yeah. But I, I just like to have it with me, and I don't have to wonder where my bag's at. Right? I just pull it out. Patient, to your point, weight or age, I can do either off that chart. I just flip it there, clip it back. It's rub- I keep it rubber banded together, and then it's always up. Right? Things uh-huh. change in five minutes. I just pull it out and be like. I need this much, right? So use your tools, right? And the other, and one more point about that, those charts is they are all drugs that are permitted to be given in our protocol, not just resuscitation drugs. So everybody's like, I've got a Braslow tape. Cool. How much Zofran do you give your, you know, (laughs) your five-year-old that's been puking for five? Well, uh, it's not on here. I know it's not. It's resuscitation values only, right? Um, So that is, we tried to make that an all-encompassing tool. And then, of course, on that chart as well is all your resuscitation values when somebody's hypo, when the kid's hypotensive and how much volume constitutes a bolus and all of those math things that we were taught to do that... You know, unless you do it every day, you're not going to remember to do so. And don't forget too that, that don't forget that if you have a UH drug box, you have a Brazil tape because they come in the certain. They dose. come in the certain. So, dose. yep. Yeah, yeah, they're going to put you in the same category, um, in the the color that is given to you from certain dose correlates with you know the the name brand Braslow tape and I believe PD tape and some of the off brand tapes uh, from the other vendors also match those. So yeah. In, in my house, I've actually done away with the Braslow just bought the Certidose tape. Oh, right? okay. And I've got that uh, wire tied to my uh, my my uh, pediatric carts, right? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. you could literally go whoop, whoop blue, boop, and then, you know, you, you have everything you would need, right? So for all cases. So that helps builds muscle That's memory. Good. I don't have to, you know, they don't have to mm-hmm. worry about it. Uh, is it a resuscitation? I need a browse low or can I, you know, is it medical? Should I go reference the protocol? It's just all in one spot, right? Um, but again, that's that kind of goes back to you should always be re reevaluating, you know, your your deployment strategies and your your equipment and you know how best to utilize it with, as we introduce new things and then bring stuff to bring stuff to bear on patient care. So anything else about Hepburn? 
sorry. No, I, I guess track this hour, but not necessarily. We've said all the things about heparin, so I guess you can talk <laughs> now. <laughs> well, what the doc talk is? Not necessarily concentration, but just realize that what the contraindications are to heparin for your STEMI. So if a patient's anticoagulated, they're not right. going to get heparin. If they are on an antiplatelet medication, they don't get prolent. Right. So just make sure you're asking those questions of your patients and knowing what medications are on. And I can get on a soapbox about medications. I won't, but medications are important, and especially your antiplatelet medications, your anti uh, uh, anticoagulants as well. So just make sure that if they're on them, that's if they're on uh, an anticoagulant, they're not getting heparin. Correct. And I think the other part of that is, I know you and I have taught CEs together, and they're like, well, they say they're on, you know, Coumadin. So do I give them, do I give them Berlenta? And I, I like I always liked your follow-up, did you take it today? Right. All right. Did you did you take your medication today? Well, no. And then that's your deciding yep. factor. That helps you channel that in because I think sometimes they get hung up on it. Well, they're prescribed it. But are they actually taking it? Is yeah, the patient correct. actually? You know, Same could be said. A is lot it biologically of active in my patient? Yeah, yeah 100%. You know, yeah, are correct. they at their therapeutic level in correct. theory? And like for aspirin, I mean, generally most adults will take an 81 every day, but that's not what the protocol says to give. So you, you should ask and, and then withheld that 181 if that's what they did take for the day and give the rest. So, yep. um, I'll be honest. If they took the aspirin in the morning, they're having an MI in the afternoon. Just give them all They four, can have the whole better. load. I mean, for for aspirin is a normal, a typical dose of aspirin, right? If you're taking aspirin for a headache, you're going to take four to forty. Yeah, you're going to you're going to take <laughs> three hundred and twenty four milligrams of aspirin as a regular dose. It's four to six hours. I mean, it's it's totally fine. I if you want to take off the eighty one, you can. Studies show that it's anywhere between uh, one sixty two to three twenty four is the appropriate dose. <laughs> If you give a little bit of extra, it doesn't matter. If you give a little less, as long as you're in that range, that's an appropriate dose. We just say 324. If, if I can touch on one kind of broad topic here, and as you were talking, I'm like, boy, these people really got to be tired of us talking about medications. Because it seems like we always talk about medications. Uh, well, first of all, it's because we all kind of like pharmacology and we like to mess around with it. But uh, the, the second part to that is, you know, there's really two things, especially for our advanced providers, our advanced EMTs and our paramedics in the group, right? There's two things you have to be 100% on all the time, right? And that is medication administration. You can't take these things back. And electricity, right? So, you know, why do we spend so much time on mm -hmm. electricity and yeah. and drug? Because they're the most important things and some of the more important things. And when, when we screw them up, we can... We, we can make a mess, right? Correct. Um, but so, yeah, we like to talk about it, but <laughs> but, but also, you know, they're, for, for good reason. It's, it's near and dear to all of us, right? I think we talk a little bit about epi. So you got to go to the uh, – uh, let's talk about all the epis, right? So there's, yeah. there's, there's a couple epis on our list here and uh, – what was that? The weird noise. And, Either his firehouse or mine. Oh, got it. <laughs> no, you. Oh, I mean, it was in the other room. And then uh, – well, how about the, let's talk about the racemic epinephrine. Um, so the there's the, we have this thing. It looks like our albuterol. And actually, I'm surprised that it looks like albuterol. It looks like atrovent. Um, you know, knock on wood. But you know, I'm I'm really surprised we don't see more people get those mixed up and confused. I know of a few stories over the over the years where it's happened. <clears throat> Um, you know, the good news, again, to, you know, your, your previous commentary about that, you know, probably not going to hurt anybody too bad, but it's still a medication error. Um, we talked about reporting a minute ago, but we didn't touch on there is there is now a reporting mechanism based yep. ba baked into the protocol. Right. If and that's for self-report. And that's mm -hmm. the, the last. Not only self-report, but any serious incident serious that happens incident. that either you witnessed or you are a part of that you want to bring to UH's attention totally anonymous. Correct. Um, can be, or you can, can be, or, or you can, can actually say, "Hey, this is you know, this is our department, or yeah. this is me, and I had this problem, and be aware of this." Uh, certainly, we, you would want to know. I certainly would want to know. Hey, we had this had this error before. You know, we find it in QA. That's Correct. not the way. But I think it's it's important to note too that that's not a retaliatory thing. That's that's strictly a it's a safety and education safety thing. and education, education. thing. And, and, sadly, and it will be yeah. re reviewed if it, something gets put out there. We will take time to look into it and review it. So just understand that if, if something gets noted there, we, we will follow up and do due diligence. And, yeah. and we've seen some inappropriate uh, entries of basically retaliatory yeah. stuff. Is people like, you know, the other crew didn't do this and mm -hmm. I knew this was appropriate. Yeah. But that, that's not 
that's, bring that to your med director. That's that's, that's <laughs> yeah. interdepartmental stuff that needs to you know stay within department. If it, it works up through their QA to the medical director or EMS coordinators, that's that's the correct pathway for those things. And um, I think if when those get submitted, I think that if it's my cruise, I always will get a copy of it. You'll get as well, it'll so. get peeled off to you, correct? Or whomever's doc, whoever the doc is. So uh, uh, medication error. If you happen to give racemic epi in <laughs> lieu of albuterol or atrovent, then that would be the report or mechanism. But um, the, you know the important the difference there. The, the reason we have the racemic epinephrine is because we're dealing with a completely different airway problem, right? Mm -hmm. Where the lower airway, we've got, um, you know, we've got bron reactive, you know, bronchus, bronchial, uh, we've got bronchial constriction. Beta agonists will help us tremendously with that. Upper airway is yep. a completely different problem. Correct. And we actually need uh -huh. an alpha agonist for that. So anybody want to run from there or I just keep talking? <laughs> well, see what you got to say. <laughs> all, all, all right. <laughs> you know, and, and, that's, and that's where... Um, you know, that's really where the, where the difference with racemic epinephrine comes in, right, is where albuterol, we've shaved off that alpha component of that, that, that alpha uh, sympathetic stimulus, and uh, we've shed the, the beta-1, right, which is why it's a beta-2 agonist that works on lower airways really, really well, and that's, you know, it's ubiquitous, and we've talked about it ad nauseum on other, other podcasts. I'll correct you, and it, it is totally selective, but does have some crossover. Nothing is perfectly correct. Yeah, so Correct. Yeah, yeah. I say for, we cleave that we off. We do, but, but yeah. if you give enough albuterol, you're going to get a tachycardia from that. Yeah. And more in kids than you are in adults, but also understand that that is expected. Mm -hmm. And I think we talked about that. Uh, you brought it up. Was you know, there's this this misconception that if somebody's already tachycardic and we give albuterol, the heart rate's going to keep going yeah. up. And that's not not the case, right? Often they're tachycardic because they can't breathe. We fix the can't breathe. Is their heart rate going to dive back down to? A heart, you know, a resting heart rate of 62. No, no, really. no, no. Even even if you had one or two, right? Yep. Because nothing's perfectly selective. But for the most part, we've cleaved yep. off off those. We've got this beta two selective. All that alpha uh, is still is still very very available. As a matter of fact, bigger molecule of such in racemic epinephrine, so it stays in the upper airway and 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 actually causes the. Um, the capillaries that have basically swollen and, and 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 closed up to constrict and open the upper airway back up. You, you essentially have a vascular problem in your upper airway as opposed to a uh, yeah. is, is it really a, the way I, I've taught it and thought about it, right? Is I need a drug to work on vasculature less bronchioconstriction on, in lower airway. So I need something with a lot of alpha. Mm -hmm. In the absence of racemic epinephrine, which is better tuned, and I think it's like 15 milligrams of epinephrine equivalent or something, 14.5 or... Yeah, it's a high I dose. It's it's ridiculous. I don't have one here. I usually just read the package. <laughs> but there's like 14 or 15 milligrams equivalent in one half of a milliliter of racemic epi, right? And if you put a, if you put a half of a milliliter in a nebulizer and you turn it on, the result is going to be... <laughs> <laughs> right, it's gonna, it's gonna go it's gonna, and it's gonna immediately run out. Right, half of that's just gonna be sitting on the walls of the neb chamber. Oh, yeah. Right, so we have to we have to dilute that down. Right? Mm -hmm. We have to dilute that down, and we throw three mLs uh, three mLs of saline. Um, certainly, I recall being being taught um, in the late '90s that you had to use you had to use sterile water. Because the salt in sodium chloride was bronchial reactive, right? <laughs> and that subsequently has been completely dis – that's been blown up. That's not a thing, right? So you can just – here's – what do you need to dilute a to, – to, you know, to dilute to racemic epi? It's right, it's right here in my hand, right? Just three mLs or so of that. Honestly, it depends on what you read, right? I've read, I've read it to – I've read it and know it two different ways, right? Which is add two and a half milliliters to make a total of three or add three. I keep it simple. Protocol keeps it simple. Just add three. Just add three. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what we really wanted to do is run longer yep. so you mm -hmm. get all the advantages uh, of that uh, of that drug. Yeah, you just want better absorption of it. Just yeah. increasing the volume is all you're doing. Uh, increasing the runtime in the NEV. Yeah. And then doubling back to the package, um, pharmacy does a good job in the drug box since 
it does sit in between albuterol and a duoneb. A lot of times the racemic epi that we're buying, you can see it in a green package, but the majority of the time the racemic epi that UH Pharmacy is purchasing has like a chevron red, which is really good. So it kind of catches gotcha. your eye and say, hey, yeah. this, this yeah. is different sitting in the middle. So I think that also helps to reduce errors because we're always looking at that. I actually haven't seen that chevron, chevron one. Mm -hmm. The yeah, one the ones that I generally get is just like a red and white uh, flagged. So I think it. a it question that, that would come out would be how do you, you know, we've talked about the difference between the, the receptor sites and where it's hitting. Oh, please, yeah. ask, how, please ask the question. How please do I differentiate the, between an upper oh, and a lower airway problem? And I, I think that goes down to touching my patient, osculating my patient, Listen. and we can have a definitive line of upper and airway and lower airway. And if this sounds good, it's not lower. <laughs> so, uh, but anything? <laughs> you also need to know what normal sounds like, right? So hopefully over your experience, you've touched and you've listened to lots of patients. You know what normal airways sound like. One of my big pet peeves is when I go through all my training uh, and I'll pick on uh, when I have to do ATLS and I say, oh, they've got decreased breath sounds. Every patient I listen to has decreased breath sounds. But that in ATLS is supposed to trigger something to me. And again, difference between the real life answer and the book answer, right? But I listen. Yeah, those sound like really good lungs. I tell people like, oh, you have – I sound – like this, these are really good lungs to me. I don't think that this is what's going on. But if if they're having croup, it's also going to be a kid who's got a seal bark cough. You've got these other indicators to point you down in that direction with super clear lungs. And when you listen to a normal kid, yeah, you got fantastic breath sounds. Sixty-year-old COPD patient, not so great, right? And just understanding what normal is supposed to sound like or what absence is, because absence is another issue. Yeah, that's true. And, and there's really good apps out there. YouTube has really good videos. You play long sounds. You put your stethoscope on the speaker with it turned real low, mm -hmm. and it gives you really good ideas of what those sounds should be. Um, our high fidelity mannequins now come with long sounds that we can program, and you can listen and oscillate. But the more real flesh you can get the stethoscope on to listen, the better. Listen to your own lungs. Listen to your own lungs. Your spouses, your significant other's lungs, your kids' God. lungs. Who knows what you might find? A yeah. gallop or a clip that you didn't know you had? And <laughs> <laughs> stop listening, stop listening, stop listening. <laughs> but um, I was really hoping that you were going to ask the question, how <laughs> how do we make racemic epinephrine? So that was going to be my follow-up uh, question. I was, I was, so I'm if I don't push, have I'm, it in I'm, my box. I'm going to push you off the chair. <laughs> but we've been asked this question. You know this is a pet peeve of mine. I figured you were baiting me, right? Which is how you know how do you make it? You're not a chemist. Uh, you, you can't make it, right? Right. Well, not you only can, that, but can, we don't carry racemic we, epi. We can use a sub, we can substitute, <laughs> substitute another epinephrine preparation yes. for it, which uh, people uh, often want to inappropriately say. I made racemic epi by by at now. Which, which just, is a great used, talking used, point. That what is, is the difference between an epinephrine and racemic epinephrine? It's the um, well, we talked about that just now, right? Yeah. The size of the molecule, the, the the added alpha component to that, the lack of selectivity. From, you know, from the from albuterol, we talked about the, those bits and pieces. But I the, mean, do you want me to get nerdy with the difference between racemic and, <laughs> and epinephrine? <laughs> Go. So I was operational stuff. <laughs> uh -huh. So racemic epinephrine. There are two types of epinephrine uh, in the world, not necessarily in your body, but in the world. Isomers. Yep, there's isomers. Mm -hmm. There's left and right. Yep. So I believe it's left is the epi that's in your body, and most things are left in the body. Um, when we make epi in a lab, we make both isomers, left and right, in about a 50% concentration. So the when we make epinephrine, we have 50% left, 50% right. Racemic is that mixture combination of left and right isomers combined. Um, that's what we give uh, when we inhale it for croup. When we're talking about giving IV epi, that's all left. Uh, it's selected to be that because that's what your body will recognize. Your body does not really recognize the right. So that's the nerd answer. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag Dr. Word. <laughs> <laughs> And I think it just boils down because Caleb's right. We do get that question a lot. So if – and that, I believe that's our fail-safe as well. So if racemic epi is on shortage, which knock on wood, we really haven't had to deal with too much, then you can use, you know, um, the forbidden 1 to 1,000. I always right. say that one, word. I'm one, sorry. One that's milligram just, to one milliliter. It's built in there. But, yeah, the one milligram to one milliliter and you put that in the nebulizer and you're able to utilize it. It's just – it's not as high concentration of epi as you would get with the racemic, but it's at least doing something to try to, uh, you know, assist that child that's in having a croup emergency. And, and a or, reminder. Or, or adult. 
Yeah. yeah, or adult. Or an adult. Strider and yeah. adult. Strider and adult. Strider, Strider yeah. and adult. Croup and a kid. doesn't matter what you're calling it. We're talking True. about the yeah, you know, same physiology going on in the upper airway. Um, our response is the same. Yes. Yeah. Our response is the same. Were you saying something, John? I was just going to say, uh, just a reminder, when we're talking about like patients with difficult IV access, you can't get IV access, or you don't have an IO, that there are medications, and lots of your medications can go in an ED tube if you need to. And epinephrine is absolutely one of them, that if you have no access on a patient and they're intubated, you can go via ET tube. The, uh, you wanted to... Uh... Make you wanted to make sure that you pointed out that you know you weren't stumbling on the one to one thousand versus one milligram per milliliter Correct. vernacular, right? Because we were asked, uh, sure, what has right, it been right. five, six, seven years ago at this point? I can't yeah. remember the time. <clears throat> stop but using. We're, one we're asked. We're, we've been asked to you know stop using the ratio expressions, which makes beautiful clinical sense, right? Because everything else is milligrams per milliliter, micrograms yeah. per milliliter. Yes. It's the only thing we had, right? Mm -hmm. And let's think about our own. I mean, how much time in medical school did we like? Have to, how many times did it have to be repeated to us till we finally understood what the hell they were talking about, right? Um, but it's still it's it's still okay for us to use that vernacular amongst ourselves. We just have to understand that when we reach in our drug box, you're not going to find anything that says one to one thousand anymore. It yeah. is going to say one milligram per one, milliliter. Correct. Right? So you know, you, you and I having this conversation, or you know, it's it's not inappropriate for it's not like a forbidden word, right? Or a forbidden, <laughs> for, no, for, but, forbidden but you will you will confuse the up and coming paramedics. Correct. We, so yeah, you, we have to be clear, right? That, you know, when you reach in the box, it's going to say one milligram per milliliter. Uh, when you yes. reach in and you grab your cardiac epi, it's going to say point one zero point yep. one milligrams. Per, it's, gonna, it's not going to say one to ten thousand anymore. So if we if we use that much like we would you know use Zofran in the back of the well yeah. that's I can't I can't, yeah, I, can't Zofran on the I can't send my EMT yeah. into my box and say hey bring me back Zofran they're going to come back empty handed right they have, like to, they have to they have to they have to you know the only thing that's for the most part I think pretty ubiquitously the only thing that I routinely see that is always trade name is solumedrol is methylprednisolone. Yeah. I've never seen yeah. a... I'm sure it exists. I think Zofran... Zofran... Solumedrol is easier than methylprednisolone, right? Yes. Zofran is easier to say than on dance I think that's why we do it. It's easier to say. It, it's easier. In conversation... Yeah. Well, yeah. When I teach, you know, I try to use both names for the... Yes. Purpose of, mm -hmm. of educating that you know. In the, recollection. The, all right. In the I'm back. Put in, a the name ba to something. In, in the back. Yeah. In the back of the truck. Do I speak that way? Of course not. It's like hand me the sofa. But we all know. Me, I right? mean, as, as seasoned people, you all know too. If, I, if I'm running an arrest and I say, hey, "Hand me Epi," I know my partner's going to give me the correct Epi. Yes. <laughs> so it's the same thing. It's uh, or risk getting it thrown back at them. Yeah. Give me the wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Little vials coming at you. Wrong <laughs> one. <laughs> And then we never actually talked about all, uh, the substitution, which is just regular epi, one to one thousand, or, or supposed, one milligram and one ml, occur, like one milligram yes. per milliliter. Uh, you can just put one milligram per milliliter in your nebulizer, but that doesn't need to be diluted, right? It is already, like we talked about earlier, half half a milliliter is the equivalent of fifteen. Yeah. Of those, so you don't need to dilute that. Just you can just put it. Yeah, the volume's already there. And yeah. I, th I find myself teaching when I say it. I usually say both. I say the old name. I say the new way. So like right. because in CE, uh, a lot of people are still hung up on that. So if you say both, it covers young, new, up and coming. I think it's just good coverage of it. But well, it's the, just burnt the, into my brain cells. I say it, <laughs> and then I catch myself saying it. So then yep. I say that. <laughs> I do it too. And but the it, the labeling has changed. And I think that's a good point, just to, as a reminder to people, because they pull it out and they look at it, and it's like that does not point one ml. You know what I mean? Or point one milligrams per m per yeah. ml. It's like oh, well, it's like no, it's still a milligram. It's just in ten <laughs> mls. So it's just we talk about that, and it's always worth the time. Yeah. Always worth the time to double check if you're not sure. Like, I, I had a mental block for the longest time. I don't know why. When I had fenogran in the drug box, I could not remember the generic, you know, the trade name. Uh, uh, excuse me, the generic name. Uh, I could not remember prom promethazine to save my life. Right. Yep. Rolls off the tongue now, but uh, why? Why I couldn't when I had it? It was just that weird thing, and I knew that about myself. And always took the time to double check so I wasn't grabbing the wrong thing. Right. So. Epi. So what about moving on to epi, epi as push dose? Well, we've, I think we've beat that to hell in other episodes. But have we beat? Let's, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Why can't I just drip the epi? It turns out you can. Right. It turns out there's really easy And we get this question it. a lot at yeah. CEs. I'm sure everybody uh -huh. does. Why don't we just drip the epi? Well, guess what? <laughs> You absolutely can, right? In, in, in the 23 protocol, we baked we baked in the ability to do an epi drip as 
you or your medical director sees fit. Now, it's not in the protocol proper. It's in the med page, and mm-hmm. it's I think it's literally the last thing on the page, if I remember correctly. I so. But it's there. We wanted you know to empower you if there was need and necessity. So if you've got a forty minute transport time and you're you know you're pushing them you know uh, you know you're pushing you know 10, 20, 30 mics q two three minutes. Yep. Uh, you got your work cut out for you, right? Of course, you know. To your point is, why can't I just mix that drip up and and, and drip it, right? That then enters into some anxiety with some providers, specifically those of us that are old enough to remember dopamine and uh, you know other other presser drips in the field. Well, we had Levo in the in the field, you know, long long ago. The lidocaine right. clock, remember that? Uh, right, the right. Old we, way we used right. to learn, <laughs> and. Um, you know, I, I think anybody's reticence to consider a drip really comes down to math, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's can I do the math on the fly? Do I remember this stuff? I did it once in paramedic school because I had to. How do I make it work operationally, right? So um, conveniently, your question about my push dose, right? Uh, there is a real, real, real simple, easy uh, transition to epi drip, right? And that is you've mixed by taking, as we've asked you to do, through training and whatnot, huh. is take a milligram or a thousand micrograms and put that in a 100 milliliter bag. And then don't I have a 10 drop minute? <laughs> uh, you, yeah. So if you put that, if you put a, if you put a thousand mics or one milligram in a 100 bag, so you've effectively divided that by 100, right? Yields a 10 mic per milliliter concentration. If you then take that same bag and spike it with a 10 drop set, which means that every 10 drops that falls in the drip chamber equates to one milliliter. Every milliliter, as we just mixed it, is 10 mics. That means from a just keep it simple, you know, stupid standpoint, every drop is a mic, right? It doesn't get much easier than that. So if over the last five minutes I've put, I've, you know, pushed uh, 10 mics and the patient laughed at that and the blood pressure hardly moved. So then I pushed, you know, 30 mics. All right. So total, a total of 40. I'm two minutes into my, into my procedure. Right. And let's say that got us somewhere, but didn't get us where we needed to go. And the next time we push another, you know, 30 mics, total of 70 over, let's say seven minutes. Right. I'm doing real easy here. So I'm not going to screw, <laughs> screw it up on, <laughs> screw it up on camera, but you know, now I've given 70 mics, you know, over seven minutes, 10 mics, the, the, the math is just whatever you gave over time is, is then what, how many drops, boop, 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 boop. in this case, it was 10 for my own convenience, but, um, <laughs> you know, but 10 drops, one milli is, and, you know, they're going to 10 mics a minute, you know, they're on out. It's easy, easy to get. It's not the end all be all, right? Because there may have been other contributing factors that got that blood pressure. So you may have to titrate that up or down afterwards, and that's totally appropriate and that's totally okay. Yeah, and all the tools you need to make that drip are in the drug box now. So we removed, you know, when we when we removed dopamine, we were also removed the sixty drop drip set. So, you know, each drug box has two Curaplex ten drop drip sets, um, fully needleless setup. I believe it might have one needle port and one needleless setup. It just depends on you know variation of supply and demand, but. Everything you need should be in the bottom of your drug box to make this happen. Whether you want to push it or you want to drip it, you have you have both options, and it's just provider preference. And your medical director, yeah, yeah, they, they may or may not have a have a preference, yeah, a preference on that as well. And I know medical directors in our system that are in favor of both ways, right? Yep. Just chase them with the push dose, and others like eh, get them where they need to be, and then please put them on, you know, please start a drip. Right? So again, that goes back to to knowing your doc and, you know, interfacing with your doc. So we, we do that. Any preference on whether or not we piggyback that with saline or just let it drip on its own? I, I would piggyback it. I mean, I have to start the IV anyway. Mm-hmm. And if I want to shut that off, I still want the main line. And I, I don't want right. to do extra stuff. So right. that, and you keep a patent line. They can have the yep. vo- they can have the volume at the same time. Even if that bag's yep. running wide open, they're still getting 10 mics a minute. Or in, in my case, they probably, they they probably down, knew that they, they, and need, the, volume, they need the they volume, volume too. Yeah. Uh, but as long as you haven't shut down your main line enough that you don't see your 10 drip dripping anymore, then, <laughs> <laughs> then they're well, not getting there. Yeah, I mean, if, if, if that's the case, then you know, that bag is just not lower than, yeah. than the uh, the other bag, right? Was there anything else on the epi drips? I think that was the... I think that was it. Uh, I think that covers the math it. Is, math is straightforward there. You really don't have to be a... Super simple. Well, and, and make it easy on yourself, right? 
just make it easy on yourself. We've 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 touched on cognitive offload a few times, but you know this is just one of those simple things. It's yeah. you know do it the easiest way. Set yourself up for kiss. Right. Success. Keep it simple, stupid. Set yourself up for success. Because uh, the, the way I was taught to do epi drips long, long ago in paramedic school required we required the math. You had to do you had to uh, you had to do and get the numbers yeah. right. Um, again, nice round even things. Um, and if I can just indulge you guys for a second, that's why when we started doing push dose epi. So if Scott's going to make an error, it's going to be because he put the decimal point in the wrong spot, right? <laughs> Scott's bad with decimal points. It's, it's, a, it's a flaw. I know that, right? Um, so mentally, I've just began thinking about all of my epinephrine preparations in micrograms. It's all whole numbers. Scott yeah. can do whole numbers, right? <laughs> um, so, you know, I've got 1,000 mic per milliliter. I've got 100 mic per milliliter, or I'm going to make 10 mic per milliliter, and I just – that is now my mindset for all this because I took the ratio expression, which was hard to hard to understand on a good day, threw that out the window. I took the, the milligrams per milliliter, which has my my you know offending decimal point in there, threw that out the window, and then just do all whole numbers. It works for me, but you know, it just you need to think about how you process information if if you want to be a accelerated provider. That's that's part of the. But this is an easy again tabletop exercise with fake Absolutely. medications, syringes, yep. and trip sets. And you're gonna get better once you practice it. And yeah. I, when we rolled this out, I've started using push dose epi in our in my resuscitations to see how it goes, see how easy it is yep. to do it. I know Dr. Spanner's done all that too, and it is really easy once you get. You gotta get used to it. You yeah. gotta do it on tabletop. Yep. All right, moving on. You brought uh, this up. TXA. This apparently is gonna be the the the, the, the Caleb the Caleb half hour because this was, this was <laughs> the other thing you you brought up is is uh, I guess I never actually finished the note here, right? Um, is topical TXA? No, just uh, as far as epistaxis goes, um, just remember we have TXA. Yeah. And TXA does not have to be given IV, uh, and in this case, it can be given topically. Right. And and so, what would be the best way to do that with a nosebleed? I mean, we have gauze. We have yeah, yeah use we, <laughs> any gauze product in the bed. impregnate the gauze yeah. and and use it as needed. Um, like anything else, though, remember once we get it in there, don't don't rip it away. Uh, we're going to break clots that are trying to form and cause more bleeding. But uh, TXA is another great one, especially for nosebleeds. The um you know, the protocol, it, I, when that came out, one of the more prevalent questions was, well, how much do I use? It, it does not, it does not matter. It's Impregnate just, the gauze, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> and it's dripping off, that's enough, that's right? Enough. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, use whatever gauze product to Don't to, drown to your pack. patient. That's <laughs> a Dr. Cox answer. Open their mouth, <laughs> yeah. throw it in there, whatever it whatever is in the mouth, that's the appropriate dose. <laughs> appropriate dose. Um, but for, yeah, for nosebleeds, all I do is I have them blow their, 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 their I blow their nose out. Um, I have Afrin, so they're going to do some. They're going to do nasal. We're going to hold pressure. If that doesn't work, they blow their nose out again. And I do TXA. So blow their nose. Make sure you get all that blood out. Get your uh, soaked gauze. And typically, we say 500, m 500 milligrams per one, but that is going to completely soak whatever you're going to put up there. So uh -huh. you're going to soak it. I will put 500 into a little container and soak it in there. And when I pull whatever. Yeah, it, it's <laughs> dripping, right? <laughs> and then you pack their nose, and then you put pressure, and where's then our you dripping? Wait. Where's our dripping sound? <laughs> <laughs> so. And then if it stops, great. Um, if it doesn't stop, bring them to us. We've got more tools in our tool bag that we can whip out and. Oh, you may be cauterizing, or I mean, it's just a cauterize place. liquid cocaine. So we do carry cocaine in the uh, hospitals for nosebleeds, actually. So we have other things that we can do. We have other devices that we use, but typically it's more going to be just direct pressure on what's bleeding with some specialized device that has um, essentially like quick clot stuff that's that's on it that we activate and we just pack their nose. The uh... I'll tell you, at the regional protocol level, there's been some light discussion about using it topically for other things, you know, like you know, road rash and and things like that. Right? Now, are we there yet? We're not. No, but you know, it's being discussed, and huh. so I, I think I think this is one of the, those meds kind of coming into its own. We're just going to see it, you know, used more and more and more, um, you know, as we go. So, yeah, definitely. All right.
while while, while uh, Dr. Hill is looking at this uh, EKG. Qu questionable EKG here that just got text to him, so we'll uh, <laughs> we'll move on to, to vital, vitals with sign offs. You brought up um, the doctor's hundred hundred rule, and why don't we start with that, and, and then we'll go on to why why the sign offs on or why the vitals are so necessary on sign offs. So I think one of the things that one of our medical directors, you know, Howard has pushed in the past is if we go to somebody's house and, you know, they tone it and it's like, well, it's a lift assist. And a lot of times crews get that in my head. Well, I'm just going to go. I'm going to pick them up. See ya. I'm going back. Especially you know? in the frequent flyers. Yeah. And, and we can all, I think if you've been in this field long enough, you're going to get bit on that frequent flyer yeah. or that, well, this is just a lift assist. So that's what I went there for. And I think... We need to ensure that, you know, we'll get into vitals a little bit more, but when you obtain those vitals and why it's so important, if you did obtain vitals from the patient, which you're required to do on lift assist and on these refusal patients, we're doing that for a reason. Because if we go there and now my patient's heart rate is 124 or their blood pressure is 76 over nothing, why is that? Why is their heart rate elevated or why is their blood pressure lower? So that was, you know, that's Howard's point. I think it's a valid point. If their heart rate's over 100, their blood pressure is less than 100, you know, is, is this the way your body is normally? Is a good, you know, first question to the patient, do you take blood pressure medications, starts that conversation, or is that patient that is needing consistent lift assist, do they have a UTI? And now that you look a little bit deeper and you have a, more of a conversation with them, they do have an elevated heart rate. Maybe the respiratory rate is 26 because did we sit there and count that? Did we pay attention to some of the finer details? And the goal is, is to make sure that that patient, if sick, is transported to the emergency room so that we're not going back to that hospital. It's appropriate per, care. Yeah, we're not, we're not going back to that same house now 24 hours later and they're in septic shock. Or they've, they've definitely had a decrease in, in whatever you know medical issue that they're having. So it kind of catches it earlier, gets them to the hospital, and then that should reduce your frequent flyer things. Some things that organizations can do is you can run you know, repeat addresses in the past 24 hours. So if you've gone to the same house multiple times and outside of medicine, you know, Dr. Spanner talks about it, we're all human beings. Maybe that patient just needs some resources at their home. Maybe that might take you a little bit of time or send an email maybe to your officer or trying to connect with, you know, maybe Meals on Wheels, um, you know, elder, the Office of Elderly Affairs. You know, I, I've reached out to them a couple times in, in our organization and it's proved very beneficial to the patient where it's, it's decreased that call volume from once a day to maybe once a month um, with one patient. Now that's not gonna happen every time, but a little bit of compassion and maybe 15 minutes of your time could really change that person's life or help them. I think that even goes into, <clears throat> if, they, if you have great resources, great, but what's coming in popularity to this region is community paramedicine. And if you have those freaking flyers, getting a program started where you have a paramedic or a nurse that can actually work with those people in the field, mm -hmm. dramatically going to decrease your uh, your call volume to that one patient at least. Yeah, 100%. So I know it was kind of like started as 100-100 and mm -hmm. navigated through a couple so what, different what is, things what there. Is, but... What is Dr. Howie Dickie White's 100-100 rule? So his his hundred hundred rule is if their blood pressure is less than a hundred or if their heart rate's over a hundred, then we need to seriously evaluate does this patient need to go to the hospital yeah. or dig deeper to try to find Un more of a definition. Understand why. Yeah, right. understand understand why. And that might be that patient, like, you know, we were we were talking on uh, on our break, you know, well, well, my blood pressure is normally less than 100. Okay, you know, there's a simple conversation back and forth, but, but you're maybe, gonna, maybe you're we're missing gonna something. You're that, right? Correct. 100%. Hey, That's, I got a low blood pressure, but if you have been on that patient multiple times and you document a blood pressure every time, you can go back and look to see like, oh yeah, last yeah. recall, it was less than 100. Yeah. Or I know this patient, I know their blood pressure to be under 100. Yeah, it's almost like trending. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of important. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I have to say the trigger word. We have to remember too, the protocol states that on sign-offs you're going to obtain vitals. That's not a suggestion. It states that you will. Well, those, um, are, high, those are one of your more high, that higher, is your highest, you, yeah. highest risk. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's the patient up. you didn't do anything for. So it's, it's very hard to defend. In action. Yeah. You guys yes. showed up and you didn't do anything and now the patient has a bad outcome. So that, that was my point. So if I document that the patient refused vitals and in four years from now I go to court for something or two years, mm -hmm. the patient's word is going to be against mine and they're going to say, I didn't say not to. And then, well, you said we refused. That's up to a jury at that point. So it's very important that 
if they really refuse, which every patient has that right, but we need to very well document refusals better than we do most yeah. of the time regular and reports. Ask them why. Why are you refusing yeah. A, yeah. me to take vital signs? I want to make sure you're okay. I want to make sure that fall is not from an arrhythmia. Now you, I know this patient, you have normal signs. Typically, I've seen you before. You say you don't have any heart arrhythmias, and now you're, or you're irregular. Do we now flip into AFib and we should, you know, at least take a trip to the hospital and have a further right. conversation, get it, maybe even lead, that leads me to, you're a regular now, I want to get a 12 lead on you. Yeah. Or you're tachycardic, I get a, yeah. I get, um, now you're either an SVT or you're VTAC. Oh, that explains And that's another you time, too, where, where signatures are very important. And I hate to make this into a documentation thing again, but if, if people are refusing for you to even touch them, hopefully a family member's present that can try to talk them out of it but then if they still refuse you get their signature as a witness yep. too that says look this is what i said and document who you talk to exactly yeah. put their name in the report and, and don't be afraid too to call med control i've been on the phone before with patients who let me have you talk to my physician Correct. and the physician was able to talk the patient into Correct. even going so unfortunately no matter what we're talking about whether it's i'm dealing with paramedics or paramedic students or even uh, patient, if I'm on the phone, hey, oh, the doctor wants it. Yeah, then I'll go do it. For some it's, reason, my credentials mean something, even though you and I are saying the same thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, the other thing too with refusals, if you've asked that patient multiple times, you know, I always look at the time on scene too. When you're doing QA, if the squad was there for 45 minutes, they tried, and I have all the vitals, and then you have this narrative that that's like, you know, a mile long. I'm like, well, they really tried. Like something yeah, happened. Versus the squad that was there for four minutes and. Yeah, they're cleared. No vitals, no nothing. Yeah. Patient refused. It's but like, I'll go we want to make sure we do a good job. I'll Be go thorough. a little bit further, right? And we talked about this morning, like, hi, I'm John. I'm the paramedic. How are you doing today? Yeah. I can take your pulse and you not even know it. Yeah. And I can at least gather from this, oh, you're not tachycardic. Uh -huh. I have a radial pulse. So I got a typical, I have a normal. Regular, pressure, irregular. Like, yep, you're regular, you're not you irregular. Have a yep, you're a regular yeah. I can yeah. document. Are they hot? Are they cold? Yep, yeah, you don't, have, you don't have a fever to touch. Uh, I can document that we're having a conversation. You're not speaking one word sentences. You're not in respiratory distress. You're alert. You're alert. Yeah. There's lots of things you can document from just a visual exam or mm -hmm. even just a quick touch. <laughs> <for later>. Respirations. <laughs> yeah. I, I, that that is an immediate that that set as an immediate QA flag in my organization. Nope, they can't refuse respirations. <laughs> <laughs> they re nope. <laughs> Come on, uh, it, 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 it did not go down like that. Patient was submerged to his neck and said, <laughs> "That chart had a different outcome than, than the refusal." I promise. You. <laughs> I, I, again, though, I think it's, it's the utmost importance that we are documenting that. And patients do have the right to refuse. Uh, don't get me wrong. But that's the ones we have to be most cautious about. Yeah. And, and to your point, too, Caleb, it's it's not going to be if that if any type of litigation does happen, it's not going to be in like, you know, six three months. Weeks. No. It's going to be in like three to four years. And you're how many get, encounters have you had since then? You're going to get yep. your letter that they're considering filing a, an action against you at about 11 months and then they're going to file that lawsuit within two years and then you're going to get deposed about three years later right yeah and it's, the best thing you want to say is i refer to whatever's in my documentation that's what happened do you remember it? i don't remember what what did i write down well it says you're here on scene for 40 yep. minutes you talked at length about this you talked to this family member you have their signature on it you tried you, you tried yeah yep. and the one i think we take uh, for grant a little bit to piggyback on refusals and uh, things of that nature would be a car accident. You know, those occur quite frequently in my coverage area with multiple cars, two to three cars at a time. Yep. And that now I, you turn around, you get nine refusals to do, and it's, no, I don't want to go, no, I don't want to go, I don't want to go, I want to go. And then it's three years later, boop, I want to... I want to uh, depose you because I've already subpoenaed that report. So yeah. and every organization is a little bit different. So it's also good to just have the conversation with maybe your captain, battalion command chief, staff, chief yeah. command staff. Hey, just out of curiosity, what's the most subpoenaed call from our organization? Ours is um, ours is refusals from NBCs. NBCs. So it's, I would it's, say it's that's just probably ninety percent out there. It's yeah, yeah, and and it's just freshening up your documentation, being a little bit more thorough. Yep. Oh, back on the drug kick. Yeah, yeah. Back, 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 yeah, yeah. Vitals. So we talked about what the about vitals, the sign off. Labetalol and metopol. <laughs> <laughs> that was a your grenade. grenade your, your grenade is <laughs> has fallen on the floor. So we often get uh, we often get either questions or frustration from providers because both metoprolol and labetalol are in the protocol for. 
for separate, very separate things, right? And uh, they're both red boxed. And as a general rule, we don't like to red box things, right? And by red box, I mean require medical director authorization, medical online control, med control, online med control authorization. Control authorization. Yeah, yeah. Um, we really don't. In the creation process of the protocol, we really don't strive to do that, right? We don't. We we try to try to empower the provider. However, this is one of those nuanced things. You've got two drugs in the exact same class yep. with different behaviors, right? Uh, so you they're, they're they're both beta blockers. They both end in LOL, right? And they can be clumped as well. You know. They'll fix heart rate and blood pressure. One is very selective to heart rate. The other will do heart rate and blood pressure. Mm -hmm. So the labetalol um, not only affects the beta component, but it also has some, F uh, some effect on the alpha piece of that as well. So it drives blood pressure down, whereas metroprolol only affects well, again, to, 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 to our to our previous conversation, yeah. nothing is perfectly selective, right? Yeah. Uh, but is mostly we, we've we've cleaved off the 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 alpha response on that, so it's it's mostly for heart rate, which is why you find them in their respective protocols, right? And that is the metoprolol is in our narrow complex tachycardias that are refractory to other standard of care, right? And then in the hypertensive cases, whether that's OB, to, you know, we were talking about this earlier, it's that is the hallmark. That is yep. the, the most often uh, reason that it's that it's utilized out of hospital is for uh, hypertensive emergencies with an OB, um, you know, with an uh, OB etiology. But uh, fundamentally, you've got you know, if you've got somebody who's hypertensive and you inadvertently give the wrong give the wrong beta blocker, you give the one that just suppresses beta and does nothing for the alpha. And we talked about a little bit of whether, you know, this is completely true, whether it's theoretical. Let's not find out. Um, <laughs> let, let, let's not find out. Let's let somebody way smarter than us figure this out. But we don't want to suppress just the beta and let the alpha go unchecked um, and either not address the blood pressure in the, in the blood pressure case uh, or potentially have that reflex, re reflexively go up. Alternately, if you take if you have a narrow complex tachycardia, the pr the probability is is their blood pressure is already could be marginal to begin with, right? And if we give the drug that suppresses both the rate and the blood pressure, which is going to take effect first, uh, again, let's not find that out in the back of the ambulance, right? right? So we just want to make we just want to make sure that you know the right beta blocker is being used. Your sales pitch to to the doc doesn't need to be anything more than, hey, this is a narrow complex tachycardia. I've done ba 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 and they're laughing at it. I have metroprolol, not labetalol in my hand, right? I want to give X amount, right? And that's it, right? And I think we talked in other, you know, in other episodes, get the repeat dosing information on the same call. Let's uh -huh. not call back nine times. Oh, I gave that five minutes ago. Nothing worked. What do I do now? <laughs> like, I get, get, you don't get five more. Yeah. I actually have gotten in the habit now of being like giving my verbal order and saying in the, in the, if after this amount of time, if you need to do it, you can go ahead and do it again. That way it just saves a phone call. But not everyone on the phone is going to think that far ahead. No, yeah. think that far ahead. Because you're not going to necessarily have, when you call UH med control at this exact moment, you're not always going to get a, EMS medical director. Correct. They're not going to be thinking that far ahead. Okay. Maybe in the future we get to that point, which we're slowly getting we're, to the point yeah, where yeah. you might be calling and you might actually get the EMS medical director to answer those questions for you. Absolutely. So that's why they're red boxed. That's what the, what's different between them. That's what, you know. That's why we're asking you to call. Now that you know what somebody on the other end should be listening for, this really doesn't even need to be much of a conversation. It's like, hey, I'm doing this unless you tell me otherwise. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. We've had this conversation before of like when you're calling med control and being short, concise and having an exact question what you're asking and how you ask it yep. is a big, uh, big way of how we're going to interpret it. If you call, say, hi, I'm John. I'm a paramedic with Munson Fire Department. I've got a patient who's uh, tachycardic, they're in AFib with RVR, I would like to give five milligrams of metoprolol, I'd be in, I, if that's all you say, I'm going to say, what's their blood pressure? Because you forgot to tell me that. Oh, their blood pressure, is their 140 over 90. Yep, go ahead and give it. What, yeah, versus how, somebody how who you? uses a lot of probabilities and I think. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, hi, uh, John, yeah, I'm a medic uh, with uh, 
Uh, ambulance. <laughs> ambulance I think yeah. I have a tachycardic yeah. patient, and, and he's probably not feeling good. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm coming in the woo-woo to you guys right now. Great. How far are you? See you not sure. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just hold off. We'll see you there. Supportive <laughs> care. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's all in the presentation. Yep. And if you have a short... Hey, I need to talk to the doc. Doc, this is what I got. Can I do this? We're again. We're gonna say yes if it if it sounds reasonable. If we have a question, we're gonna ask questions. Yeah, if you get blood pressure. Oh, I, I'm sorry. Yeah, blood pressure is this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I think most of our docs in med control are, are pretty good about the fact that they realize there's probably eight things going on in the back of the ambulance while I'm talking to you too, and it's it's not a bedside with you know three other people helping me. So on a critical patient, you realize that my time is of the essence as yeah. well. Yeah, absolutely. So I've heard okay. more and more that there's a possibility that we're going to explore a little more with the ceftriaxone and, and administration for open fractures and possibly going down the road for first-line sepsis treatments. Uh, what can you talk to pertaining to this? I can talk to current protocol on that. And then <laughs> I can talk about the ACS portion on that too, why it started so why we wanted to do it. Let's start there then. Yeah. Let's start there. So let me hit the let me hit with the protocol the protocol Currently. That. There is a pilot program going on at St. John's and Elyria Hospital, uh, where they have antibiotics in the drug box for use in open fractures. Um, and that is not necessarily perfectly open fracture, but anything that is potentially fractured with a laceration above is considered, yep. uh, uh, of any type of laceration above is considered an open fracture until proven otherwise. Right? Well, it goes back to what our interventions are going to be. It's going to be an uh, ANSAFO, and that's what we're going to give, right? Okay. It, what are the side effects if they don't have an open fracture? They got an antibiotic. They got an antibiotic. Yeah. Very low risk medication, low yep. risk yep. intervention. Yep. It, it's okay to do that. Like we talked about our last episode a few months ago was steroids. If they you gave them a steroid, they don't need it. It'll be okay. The side effect profile, the what's going to happen if they got that med and they didn't need it is very very low. Very risk. minimal, right? Yep. And uh, you know this this kind of came out of the the trauma service that is mandated for open fractures to give this stuff but yep. oftentimes less than one hour yeah yeah but oftentimes that is one of the more th uh, common things that gets missed in the in, missed in the melee well in between of, just of getting, getting the patient to the, to the ER. er and then once you yeah. get to the er yeah. doing another trauma assessment maybe getting imaging coming back getting a radiologist to read your images and i mean it, yeah, it could take some time. Now, you hit that one hour mark really quick. Yeah, having so. having said that, this much like last uh, la well uh, July's episode uh, about when we were talking about the steroids, right? Is this is this is being part of the bigger clinical picture, right? Mm -hmm. Is this life saving treatment? In, in, not in the immediate, right? Not immediately, so if, but yes, if, it if, is. if you are, but if you are focused on truly, you know, if you're managing airways or volume resuscitating their patient or whatever, that takes precedence over that, right? You can walk in and be like, I never got to it, and that's okay, right? But if you have, uh, you know, an isolated you mean open, a, oh, not for antibiotics, <laughs> <laughs> not out of hospital. It is. <laughs> no, like, <laughs> it might be in your world, but it's not in ours. Nope, in my world, it's still airways. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but, but if it did come to and that we are using this in our protocol it would be something you need to remember to pass on that you did or did not do. Did or did not do. Right? Yes. And that was kind of what I was driving at is, you know, life-saving stuff comes first because yeah. there's going to be, a, you know, there's certainly going to be the pushback of, you know, we're supposed to do one more thing. And well, it's an important thing, much like huh. the steroids, much like these other things that we don't see immediate effect on, but ultimately you're doing the right thing for the patient, which is why we ask you to do it in the, yeah. in the first place, right? But you do have to understand how to properly prioritize those if, um, you know, if uh, if you have other more serious priorities. And we talk airway or breathing or circulatory management stuff. Um, you know, if you've got this, if you've got five or ten minutes and, and it, it can go on, it should go on, right? Just it's, it's as simple as that, right? Yeah, just the fact that you're starting it, right? You know, it's just like it. I look at I look at this um, the same way that I would look at heparin and Berlenta, right? There's there's a STEMI. We're going to obviously treat any immediate life threats. You know, I know that's a trauma word, but medically we're going to we're going to worry about what is, what is going to kill my patient first. So I'm going to run the gamut. I'm going to give all those medications. Same thing is with a trauma patient. I'm going to treat all my immediate life threats. Do my initial trauma survey. Treat treat those wounds. Um, 
but you know in that secondary survey you know did I, what i what i'm doing is it working and then i can hang the antibiotic and you want to start that as early as possible i think it's important that's why the acs prioritizes it they want to give it in the first you know within the first hour so why not start it in the field and, and i think sometimes we get hung up on i have to give this before i get there and it's like no you don't have to if you if you've initiated it right that's great. So if you have the time, and that might be right at the tail end where I'm two to three minutes away, but you're still able to give the, you know, to start that infusion, yeah. do it. That's great. They can hey. continue it in the ER. Yeah, I mean, we will. you know, the big thing is, is now my time to that antibiotic is negative three minutes or, or yeah. whatever it is. You sure. know, it's, well, we've already started it. And that's what's important. You've for hit the a patient. benchmark. And yeah. We've, that, and that's what's important. And we understand the ACLS terminology in in your presentation there because based on you know what you're referencing but acs might mean something else to the audience so uh, a acs and oh uh, yeah ACS, acs vernacular so, like, so the american college of surgeons are the um governing body if you will for all of our trauma, our trauma services yeah. so this is one of their rules that is currently out in the gray book that you know most of our centers adhere to um, some still function under the orange book i'm a little blurry there on when the time gap is from switching from book to book but we listen to all the acs's um you know rules we follow them and antibiotics have not changed from book to book you still want to give them the first 60 minutes so let's let's push it forward let's help let's do more that's what we want to do we want to do what's best for our patient absolutely and well, moving from a trauma world back to a medical world do you foresee this happening with sepsis I don't really see it happening with sepsis. It could. Um, now, if we look at what has changed recently, we're piloting uh, antibiotics for open fractures and trauma. We've already made a change for um, giving TXA, right? On how much uh, TXA we're giving in the field, we've now changed that to be two grams from one. Yep, yep, so, yeah. because it's better for the patient outcome, right? It, it could happen in sepsis. Um, the original um, surviving sepsis study was going for three hours after um, arrival to the hospital. Um, there are the newer reversions of sepsis are looking at now like one hour bundles. Um, but the bigger problem becomes is it's antibiotic choice based upon what type of infection it is. So if we're talking about ANSEF for open fractures, it's open fractures, it's ANSEF, as long as it's not a contraindication of them getting ANSEF. It's a really simple line to follow. If we're talking about sepsis antibiotics, if we're going to cover for the appropriate bugs, it is a very, it depends on what the infection is and then what antibiotic am I choosing to cover that. And then it does change whether or not they've been hospitalized for How prior 90 acquired. days, yeah. whether it's community acquired or hospital acquired. There would be a better choice than Ceftriona. Ceftriona is a great choice. And a medic one of the medications we use for pneumonia and urinary tract infections in sepsis. However, I'm going to cover with different antibiotics if it is a hospital acquired pneumonia or a hospital acquired uh, urinary tract infection. Um, I could consider doing other antibiotics. So it's not a clear cut path. You go from point A to point B, it's point A to, well, now you have choices A through C or B. I think often people just think that <clears throat> all antibiotics treat all, all they infection. Do. You're right. There's this just... But, the, and obviously, yeah. we're going to follow gonna, that up with blood cultures, and then aerobic, the aerobic. Thing is before we give that antibiotic, um, as soon as I give an antibiotic intravenously, I just killed all the bacteria in the blood. Right. So I need to get good Culture. blood cultures, mm -hmm. and there's people's jobs dedicated to making sure that we're trained properly to get clean sets of blood cultures that are not contaminated before we start those antibiotics. So it could be considered, but that's going to be putting a lot more responsibility on you guys, making sure we're not just doing Using alcohol chlorop, prep, we're doing chlor yeah. prep. It's as, it's as sterile as we can get it, right? It's not a full sterile procedure, but sterile ass that we're going to draw appropriate blood cultures through clean tubing sets is going to be prepped appropriately we're not going to be drawing multiple blood cultures through the same line ideally in that case we'd want to have two iv sets or at least two poke sites that we're drawing from because if i do draw from one that's contaminated i want to have another set to compare it to to say is that a contamination just from that site or is that a true pathogen in the side of the patient's blood Correct. so it's a little more complicated than just uh, the orthopedic, you got broken bone, I give you ANSEF. Yeah. 
And the heart is there to pump ANSAF. It's an ANSAF. It's an ANSAF. Cape man broke leg. <laughs> <laughs> the patient's leg is broken. The patient does not have a heartbeat. The patient's leg is broken. Let's fix. ANSAF pump broken. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thanks for joining us here on the Pre Hospital Pirate Down podcast. And uh, if, if you like the kind. <laughs> <laughs> if you like the content, uh, yeah, please uh, please like us on Facebook. You know, follow us on, uh, subscribe to us on YouTube. And uh, as we've we've talked about a few other times, the, the vast majority of the content, and honestly, I think the be the better, deeper content is at prehospitalparadigm.com. So, uh, from us all here, thanks, and uh, we'll see you next time. See you next time. Yep. Bye. See you.